Good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Peter Lowen. I'm the director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto, and it's my honor to welcome you today to this uh, conversation between Peter Mansbridge and Kevin Rudd on Russia, Ukraine, and China's long game. I'm going to do quick introductions and then get right out of the way. Um, Peter Mansbridge is well known to Canadians as the chief correspondent and the host of the National uh, for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation from 1988 to uh, 2017. And he's also, we're proud to say, a distinguished fellow at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Kevin Rudd is the president of the Asia Society. He was, of course, Australia's prime minister from 2007 to 2010 and again in 2013. In the interim period, uh, was Australia's uh, foreign minister. He is, uh, uh, without question, the most knowledgeable um, person, uh, most knowledgeable first minister we've ever had in the West on China. Um, and he's a perfect person to uh, have today at the Monk School with Peter to discuss the uh, uh, role of China in the ongoing uh, invasion of Russia into Ukraine. So I'll say no more than that, except thank you uh, to so many of you from coming from around the world. And I'll turn it over to you, Peter Mansbridge. Thank you so much. All right, Peter, thank you. And uh, hello to everybody. I'm talking to you from Stratford, Ontario, which is a little town outside of uh, Toronto where I live. Um, I should let you know right now that uh, we'd love to hear from you during this uh, next hour. So if you have questions, uh, please don't be shy. You can uh, submit those questions to the Zoom app Q&A tool or at events.monk at utoronto.ca. That's how you get in and we will be monitoring those suggestions from you for questions. For Kevin Rudd, who I'm uh, very excited to have the opportunity to talk to now. Kevin is in New York uh, on this day. And Kevin, let me begin by like, putting it to you this way. You and I are in a, the unique position uh, as we speak that Presidents Biden and Xi are speaking right now in what's a very important and strategic session between the two world leaders. Uh, what I'd like to, to know from you uh, is when Biden is looking at Xi as we speak, is he looking at somebody who is still 100% committed to Russia and to Vladimir Putin? Or is he looking at somebody who, because of the last three or four weeks, is wavering in that support? Well, um, thank you very much um, for the question. And uh, it's great to be with all of our friends from Monk. Um, and from all the folks who are joining us from around Canada and around the world. I think the best answer to your question uh, is that maybe not 100% committed, but 90%. And if 90% is wavering, well, maybe. Um, but why the gap between 100 and 90? Uh, one, uh, Xi Jinping, remember, on the 4th of February, uh, signed uh, with uh, Vladimir Putin in Beijing on the eve of the Beijing Winter Olympics, uh, a joint strategic declaration, which for those of us who've studied the entrails of these documents over the last 20 years, was right out there in terms of the new scope of uh, Russia-China strategic collaboration across all policy domains, and to use the language of the declaration, without limit. Number two, um, deep um, Chinese um, strategic interests lie in maintaining a benign, and in my judgment, ultimately compliant uh, relationship with Moscow. That is, Moscow being compliant to Beijing uh, to invert the order which existed during the, cold, uh, the uh, first period of Sino-Soviet collaboration, 49-59. Um, and there's a reason for that, which is part of the Chinese deep logic, which is the benign nature of the relationship um, and the fact they now represent no threat to each other has uh, unleashed China's strategic energies and ability to focus on its principal global adversary, namely the United States and American domination of the regional and global order. I think there's a third factor as well, and that is um, uh, the um, uh, personal relationship between the two. It's highly uncommon in the Chinese political system for a leader to describe another leader as their best friend in the world. But Xi Jinping has used uh, that description about Putin for quite a long period of time now. So you have this reinforcement of what I describe as um, a formal documentary, underlying strategic uh, 
and personal chemistry attached to this relationship. Therefore, for Xi Jinping to step away from it in any way and in to be a substantive independent, as it were, mediator, um, or someone who would privately tap Xi, uh, Putin on the shoulder and say, thus far and no further, Vladimir, things are going badly. Um, this would be a very major step. The Chinese are not quite there yet. Uh, in fact, I think they're still a ways away from it. But one final little indication as to why the Chinese may be recalibrating is, is uh, the damage to their global standing uh, from being tacit supporters of the Russian invasion, their damage in particular to their brand in Europe, uh, where the Europeans have always had a soft strategic view of China. I think this is beginning to tell in the Chinese political establishment. And there are a range of dissenting views within Beijing itself. So that's why I say 9010. There is a possibility for movement at the station, um, but it's still overwhelmingly in the Putin Xi direction. And what could change that? As uh, Putin is staring at either military defeat or total military stalemate in the field in Ukraine, and or Putin coming under direct uh, and significant uh, political attack on the home front, which would threaten Putin's individual position. China, historically, under this Leninist regime, never wants to be on the side of losers. Um, so there is an ultimate Chinese realpolitik here. But uh, whereas the regime itself, minus Xi Jinping, would have, I think, adopted a much more substantively neutral position than they have so far on Ukraine, it's the Xi Jinping factor they have to deal with. But it's what happens in the field and the preponderance of forces in the field which I think underscores uh, the ultimate calculus in Beijing. Is there any doubt in your mind that Putin uh, would not have told Xi what he was planning to do when they signed that document a month ago? Um, again, I'll give you a 90-10 equation. Um, I wasn't in the room, and I'm unlikely to be invited into that room. Um, but uh, it is, for me, inconceivable that these two having had not just full bilaterals, but frankly, four eye conversations um, with interpreters, uh, where on the eve of Xi Jinping's major global party, the Olympics, and virtually on the eve of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, that Putin would have taken the risk of leaving Xi in the dark, because Putin has such high levels of dependencies on the Chinese uh, in the eventuality of the campaign having gone bad, which of course it is going bad. So I think there is a 10% possibility that it was not sketched out in all of its um, gory detail. But we should remember that this Russia-China relationship is not just a thing of recent uh, invention. The evolution of this has been intense over the last decade. China has a sophisticated embassy in Moscow. They have a sophisticated embassy in Kiev. They've been monitoring themselves through their own national means, uh, what's actually been going on the ground. So for me, it would be passing strange uh, if, um, if uh, Xi Jinping was not aware that the balloon was going to go up after the uh, Winter Olympics. From what you've heard in these uh, last days and weeks, really, um, how far do you think Biden can go in trying to pressure Xi to be more neutral, if you wish, uh, and pull his support away from Putin? I think there are three critical, um, as it were, leverage points here, which are materially relevant. One is, will China act in a manner which would provide significant financial and economic support to Russia, given the duress it's currently under? And would they, as a consequence, run the risk of incurring secondary financial sanctions against their own institutions or against the Chinese state, uh, given China's continued dependency on the US dollar denominated international financial system? The renminbi is still a, a marginal player um, in, um, uh, in uh, the um, uh, overall uh, international financial system. Uh, 
Uh, and as a consequence of that, <clears throat> I think it's fair to say uh, that um, uh, that uh, uh, on the uh, financial and economic question, you're not about to see uh, a Chinese move which would in any way threaten their own financial institutions. The second one is, uh, as you've seen it covered in the official, uh, sorry, in the unofficial briefings by the intelligence community in the United States of the world media, um, could China consider making military supplies available uh, to Russia given the depletion of the Russian military equipment in the field? Uh, that I think is an open question. We don't know. Uh, we just don't know. But I think it's sufficiently concerning to the administration. I've been in Washington the last couple of days myself. Uh, that uh, this will be, I think, front and centre in the conversation uh, that's occurring uh, right now between Xi and Biden. But there's a third one, and a third leverage point, or a third decision point. It is, does Xi have any prospect of doing what the American wants, the Americans want, which is to begin to pull up the drawbridge uh, in political and foreign policy support uh, for Moscow? That's a very big ask, um, but I think the focus of this conversation is more likely to be around one and two. If uh, one was to weigh this relationships, uh, the two relationships, China with Russia, China with uh, the West, and specifically the US, uh, if one was to weigh them just on economic benefits, is one more important than the other to China? Well, demonstrably, I mean, whether it's um, the American market alone um, is still, despite President Trump's best efforts to implement a trade war with the People's Republic of China, it's still a huge um, a net uh, national income earner for the Chinese. So uh, how does that fit in this, in, in this decision that, that Xi has to make in terms of where his uh, alliances lie, if you wish? Well, it's in the hierarchy of needs if we've studied our Maslow. And, um, and the thing about uh, Leninists is that right at the top of the uh, Maslow hierarchy of needs is uh, political and physical security. Uh, and their judgment in terms of the underlying interests of the Marxist-Leninist Chinese state uh, is that maintaining this extraordinary strategic asset, which is a benign and increasingly compliant Russian federation, as far as China's long-term national security and foreign policy interests are concerned is of overarching importance. The economic stuff comes in next, it's not insignificant, um, but if with Leninists, uh, if we've studied our history carefully, um, I have a, an issue between the security and longevity on the part of the party or the state on the one hand versus uh, how am I doing in capital markets or in, uh, or in commerce markets on the other. Let me tell you, you don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar to work out the Leninists usually back one over two. But um, I'm not degrading the significance of the economic factors, they are real. Uh, and that explains why the political, diplomatic and question mark military support uh, to uh, the uh, Russians on the part of the Chinese uh, is, uh, is there, um, or at least potentially or possibly in the case of the military factor but why at the same time the Chinese have been unprepared to cross the, risk, cross the Rubicon in terms of over defiance of the US sanctions regime financially against the Russian Federation because the Chinese do not want to unnecessarily incur the wrath of the US and its allies by shutting China off from the US did not dollar denominated international transaction system. Um. A lot of people are wondering about how Taiwan fits into this story as a result of the last month. Uh, your perspective on that is what? If China was considering a move on Taiwan, has the past month given them pause on that? In my overall assessment, no. Um, I studied in Taiwan as a kid uh, way back in the Mesolithic period. So I've kept uh, more than um, a um, uh, a passing interest in what goes on on, on the island. Uh, I have many friends there. And I do follow very closely the entrails of mainland Taiwan relations. Here is my take for what it's worth. Xi Jinping and the Chinese military and the Chinese leadership have their own internal timetable on Taiwan. It's driven by just two factors. 
One, when do we have an overwhelming preponderance of military forces against the US and Taiwan combined and possibly even including Japan, uh, that we would be 99% uh, guaranteed of a military victory. Uh, Xi Jinping and the political culture of the Leninists is not in the business of taking military chances. Uh, number two factor in determining their timetable is when will, will we be able to make the Chinese economy and financial system sanctions proof from the United States and the collective West? That's been a project underway for 10 or 20 years. In fact, steeled by China's own domestic experience, which um, um, mature folks like you and I, my friend, may remember I was imposed uh, on the uh, Chinese uh, at the, uh, following the Tiananmen uh, crackdown in 1989. And so the Chinese are still a ways away from either liberalizing the capital account, turning the renminbi into a tradable global currency, uh, and therefore they remain vulnerable uh, to a US dollar denominated uh, international financial system. Uh, and that won't change until China's economy is big enough, bold enough and ugly enough to withstand that sort of external pressure. So where does that land in my mind? It lands more or less um, late 20s, early 30s. I think this is the decade of living dangerously. That's the 2020s, something I refer to in the, the book I've just written. But where I begin as an analyst to become hyper-conscious of, um, of China crossing those two Rubicon points in their military and economic barometers for decision-making is when we start to get to the early 2030s. That, I think, is really the danger zone on Taiwan. Let me ask you about uh, Xi and whether he needs to be watching his back at all, because there, there are some people, some observers, uh, who have been writing lately that, that he is potentially vulnerable himself right now, internally, in China. Uh, and so the decisions he makes on everything, including the current one, uh, have, have consequences, have potential big consequences for him. Um, do you see his position at all vulnerable right now? Uh, not capital V vulnerable, uh, small V vulnerable, yes. You see, in all of our political systems, but particularly our authoritarian states, there's no neat uh, divisibility between internal and external politics or domestic and uh, international policy. Uh, they're not exactly seamless, but one constantly reinforces the other, uh, directs the other and shapes the other. So Xi Jinping in embarking upon this position of support for his best bud forever, Vlad Putin, um, has really been out on the head of the pack in terms of his own political and foreign policy establishments, traditional views about how to manage the Russia relationship uh, and not to lean too far. Uh, but this has very much been driven by Xi Jinping personally. And even in China in the last week, we've had one senior researcher attached to a state council uh, office of research uh, by the name of Wu Wei, uh, who has written a um, public critique of Xi Jinping's posture uh, on uh, Ukraine and Russia. Not from a pro-American point of view, but from a Chinese nationalist point of view, that this makes no sense in terms of the long-term prosecution of China's strategic contest with the United States, that this is actually unifying the rest of the world with the United States against Russia and China, etc. But I think the other thing I'd say is in terms of the domestic pressures, it's not just about a possible miscalculation on Ukraine. Um, uh, it is also a, a weakening Chinese economy in terms of slowing growth, something I've been writing about for years now because of Xi Jinping's deliberate move to the center of gravity of Chinese economic policy to the left in an anti-market pro-state and enterprise direction and thereby beginning to suffocate the animal spirits of the Chinese private sector. And on top of that, most particularly uh, the outbreak of the pandemic as it's jumped the border from Hong Kong, we now have shutdowns in Shenzhen, an extraordinary city larger than Hong Kong, just across the border, but also in Changchun up in the Northeast and something like uh, tens of thousands of cases now across the country in some 70 different cities. If you're uh, the Chinese Communist Party and Xi Jinping and you've been beating your chest, 
for the last two years about how we commies know how to control pandemics. A new bunch of uh, Liberal Democrats uh, couldn't cut your way out of a paper bag with a pair of scissors um, when it comes to controlling a pandemic. This is a very difficult message now to sell domestically for she, that the pandemic has now escaped out of uh, the box. Roll all that together. I think we end up, uh, Peter, with a, um, a really complex set of headwinds politically for Xi Jinping going to the 20th Party Congress this November. Uh, here is a random thought, but something I think is potentially significant. If, if Putin were to fail in Ukraine and to fall in Moscow, two big, enormous assumptions. And I'm no Russia expert, by the way. I, I know uh, where my expertise stops, and it's a, a long way short of Moscow. Uh, but if that was to occur, uh, the reverberation effect of that back into Chinese politics, where Putin has been Xi Jinping's pick, is quite profound. And that's when I think he would experience unanticipated volatility in the leadership politics leading to the November Congress, which determines whether Xi breaks the, un the unwritten rule of the past. Uh, in fact, the written rule of the past, which was leaders shall be re restricted to two terms of five years alone. This would be his third term. Is there is there an exit ramp for Putin that that she could create? In other words, could she be the the mediator in this? Is that a role he could embrace or or not? I think our friends in Europe uh, often um, sometimes give me the impression of thinking there are pixies at the end of the garden, um, and that is um, that. Um, here are our happy Chinese friends as a bunch of uh, international citizens, always keen to mediate in one dispute or another, um, where they've got good offices. That's not the case at all. Um, and when you've seen <clears throat> recent uh, expressions of a European enthusiasm for Chinese mediation, I think it betrays a deep level of European naivety about the Chinese Marxist Leninist state and its underpinning national security interests over the last 30 years with the Russian Federation. So having got that off my chest, uh, let, let me- I, I think I just got called a pixie at the end of the garden. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, there, are, there are good pixies and are not so good pixies, but um, it's just for those of us who know the Chinese system well, it ain't their shtick. They will talk about uh, their desired role in a mediation. But on the substantive heavy lifting of, um, of, a of being an active impartial negotiator with equities both in Kiev uh, and in um, Moscow, if you can't bring yourself as the Chinese state to describe uh, Putin's special military operation in Ukraine as an invasion, which is still the official Chinese position, but I'm not sure. I would imagine President Zelensky would be soliciting the Chinese to intervene and to put pressure on the Russians and to mediate. But here is my uh, real answer to your question, which is if the Chinese concluded that Putin was in diabolical trouble, um, they may seek not so much to rescue Putin's reputation, but to rescue Xi Jinping's reputation at five minutes to midnight by then seeking uh, to become the arbitrator of an outcome. Uh, and I think uh, Ukrainian diplomacy has been quite clever on this question of continuing to implore uh, the Chinese to do something. But again, to finish on a realistic note, for our friends in Brussels, here we are in the fourth week of a war, the Chinese don't even describe it as an invasion, and Xi Jinping has declined to take any telephone call from Zelensky. Uh, despite having had multiple contacts uh, with uh, Vladimir Putin. That's interesting. And that'll go down with some, I'm just looking at some of the questions that have come in from our audience. And I can tell you there are a few other pixies out there as well uh, on that question. So I'm glad we spent a, a few minutes on that. Um, here, here's a couple, of, we, we can whip through these. Um, Kieran Krady Akasaki, if Chinese support for Russia is as solid as we fear, are we back in the world of 1949 with two hardening rival blocs? Is a new Iron Curtain descending between West and East? 
before our eyes and where does that lead us? Yeah, I think it's a good question. We're not there yet, but here is the tripwire in my judgment. If the Chinese formed a view that it was necessary for their own national interest point of view to begin to militarily supply uh, Putin in the field, and if the US intelligence reports are accurate that the request has already been made by Putin to that effect, I think that becomes a tripwire into a whole new world of global economic and geopolitical pain. If we think the world is fragile today, on the 17th or 18th of March, depending on where you are in the world today, um, we would enter into a whole new binary global um, structure uh, of authoritarian states in one direction, of the liberal democratic world in the other direction, and frankly, a massive contest for influence in the rest of the world as a result. It's a good question. We're not there yet, but I think the core element on this agenda between the two presidents today on uh, the question of military supplies uh, to Russia from China is the ultimate determining factor. Final point on that. We often think of this purely in its geopolitics, but given we would talk, we would then be talking about an immediate wrench between the United States and China, the world's largest and second largest economies. This is vastly different from a binary Cold War with the Soviet Union and back in the late 40s, when the Soviet economy was not significant by global standards. And by the end of the Cold War, was still not significant by global standards. Um, therefore, the geoeconomic impact on the international economic system would be profound. I believe it would also throw the global economy into recession. Uh, Piero Fornoni writes, the politicians that govern countries, China, India, Pakistan, et cetera, representing uh, around 40% of the world population are de facto supporting Putin against Ukraine. In your opinion, are the majority of the people of these countries also supporting Putin against Ukraine? In the case of China, what is an interesting development in the last um, 48 hours is a report that I have seen that for the first time, the Chinese are allowing their social media uh, to reflect pro-Russian and pro-Ukrainian positions. Prior to that, it was only pro-Russian positions. So this is um, a little insight in terms of building pressures within China itself on the questions Peter, you posed me earlier in our discussion today. But in response to the question posed uh, from uh, the uh, member of the audience, I think what we do see is a big level of sentiment, particularly on the part of, shall we say, Chinese over the age of 30, um, who have a less nationalistic view of China against the United States, that, um, that uh, what Russia is doing uh, in Ukraine is unfair. Indian public opinion, I cannot comment on because I'm no expert. But if I look at the two essential decisions taken by the Indian government, one to abstain uh, in the UN General Assembly vote on the question of um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and two, uh, to now engineer this um, oil transaction with India, uh, with, uh, with the Russians. These are driven, I think, by deep realist calculations uh, in Delhi about the fact that all their military kit and equipment is currently Russian made. And secondly, they have chronic energy shortage going into a very deep period of uh, upturn in global oil prices, which has the capacity to throttle India's growth. I would have thought Indian domestic public opinion uh, would have a big range of views on this question. I can't comment on Pakistan, I'm sorry. Um, you've said at different times that you are fundamentally an optimist when it comes to the world, hmm. and specifically China's relationship with the West, that you're fundamentally an optimist. Those are your words. Hmm. Is that harder now after these past three or four weeks? Yeah, the degrees of difficulty get greater, um, um, but I do not believe 
either the United States or the People's Republic of China have a national interest or a mutual interest in blowing each other's brains out. There is a high degree of pragmatism in both capitals about how to manage, let's call it the term I've used in the past, the strategic guardrails around the relationship. The argument I advance in the book I've just written uh, called The Avoidable War, um, which I release in Washington next week, uh, is essentially this. In the midst of this great strategic competition between the United States and China, it is possible to do so either through a managed framework of strategic competition or an unmanaged no holds barred approach. There's sufficient pragmatism in both capitals to prefer, I think, managed strategic competition. And the concept I've advanced on this is, how do you identify the core strategic red lines for each side, Taiwan, East China Sea, South China Sea, cyber, space, et cetera? And how do you have, as it were, uh, diplomatic modalities, mechanisms, and, and, um, and lines of communication to manage crises which might emerge. Secondly, full-blown competition, economics, trade, technology, investment, ideology, and the rest. And then thirdly, still carve out space where it's in your national interests uh, to uh, engage in common planetary concerns, such as on climate. I think these two political cultures are sophisticated enough to manage um, such a complex approach. We often forget that the height of the Cold War with the Soviets, when they were threatening to nuke each other on a regular basis. The Russians and the Americans managed to agree uh, to eliminate, uh, through combined global action, to eliminate cholera uh, in that period. Um, there is a capacity within highly sophisticated, albeit uh, deeply ideological nation states to manage the relationships in a pragmatic way. That's the basis of my optimism. Um, this is something that you've uh, written about and talked about before. I think it was in 2017, you mentioned this, that a major threat to Western nations, especially when thinking about the rise of Russia and China, is that the West should be more aware of the health of democracies and quoting you the fundamental shifting of what democracy is. Now, that was 2017. Has the fragility of democracy led to where we find ourselves today in the context of China, Russia, and the invasion of Ukraine? It's very interesting, uh, Peter, when you look at the ideological entrails of the Chinese domestic discourse on America and the West, what they conclude is that democracy as practiced in the collective West is in a very bad way, that has rendered all of our governments uh, increasingly either incompetent or impotent or both. And thirdly, that the uh, collective West and more broadly the democratic world beyond the West has uh, uh, lost its own self-belief in its own civilizational mission. That's what I read in the Chinese ideological texts. Um, and nerds like me are required to read this stuff. And so I wouldn't recommend it to anyone listening to this program. It would um, destroy your ability to sleep for months on end. Um, but if you go through this stuff, the deep analysis uh, of all of us, Canada, Australia, uh, the United States, not just the Anglosphere, but the democratic world, is that our model is failing and that the authoritarian state capitalist model is succeeding. That actually is the internal Marxist-Leninist conclusion. When you hear Xi Jinping say, we are now entering into a period of unprecedented change. Change is not seen yet in, this, uh, in, a, in an entire century. And we are seeing the rise of the East and the decline of the West. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Um, is the four character phrase that they use to describe this. Uh, this actually is not just a random statement. It's the product of dialectical materialist analysis within their system. So we can say, well, that's, that's all commie speak. Well, yeah, but it is their deep view. Uh, 
And then there's a parallel question for us, what is the condition of our democracy? And when I uh, look at uh, any possible upside for what's unfolded in Ukraine, uh, it is this deep, deep awakening on the part of all of us and, and, our, uh, and the peoples of all of our democracies. But there is something worth fighting for here, which are liberal democratic principles. Uh, if we look at the history of uh, the world since the enlightenment, securing these freedoms is really a relatively recent phenomenon, really the last hundred years or so. When did women get the vote in Canada? When did women get the vote in Australia? Um, when did we have a universal franchise? Uh, when did we cease having to be fearful of the un unfettered powers of monarchs? One or 200 years ago? Um, my argument, and that's probably a speech I gave in Madrid that you're referring to, um, uh, is, uh, is uh, there has to be a democratic re reawakening within the democratic world as opposed to this kind of relativist view that, ah, well, democracies come, political systems go. Um, in other words, that we become so postmodern in our view of ourselves that everything becomes relative. Not in my view, and that's certainly not the Marxist-Leninist view. And I think Ukraine brings this together into a single crucible. I asked the question because for most of us, and I'm sure most of us who are, are, are watching this discussion right now, a month ago, we were we were living in a a period of some relative calm, and you know we many of us felt you know we were kind of past COVID or getting past it, and suddenly things were going to be so much better, and now this has been thrust upon us. Um, we you know we perhaps should have been much more aware that it was coming at us, uh, but suddenly there it was, which leads to this question out of that discussion we just had about whether or not, are we at you know, a hinge point in history here? I know that's an overworked phrase, and it, but nevertheless, are we? I'll start again my answer by saying, what do the Chinese think about this? And why do Putin and Xi Jinping bond so deeply on these questions? They talk about this stuff all the time. Um, driven in large part out of China's own dialectical materialist and historical materialist analysis. I had to reread Marx to understand the way in which these folks think. Um, and their deep conclusion is that we are at such an inflection point. When he says rise of the East, that means rise of China and by extension rise of uh, an authoritarian capitalist model, a state capitalist model. Um, uh, and fall of the West, decline of the West, means the collapse of liberal democracies and liberal democratic capitalism as we've known it and practiced it in our democracies for the last 100, 150 years or more. So that's their perception. Is it valid? Which is the other part of your question, uh, Peter. Uh, I don't believe so. Um, uh, on the authoritarian side of the ledger, it's, it's very strange how fearsome authoritarian states look from the outside. Um, but once you get on the inside of them, uh, strength rapidly translates into brittleness. You see, in our systems of uh, political and economic governance in the collective West, for all of our faults, and I could write you an essay on the faults of our respective Canadian and Australian democracies, and I've been part of the dramatis personae and sort of the unfolding of those things in my own country. But the bottom line is we've got two sets of flexible, what I describe as automatic stabilizers in our systems. One thing is called elections. You can kick the bums out um, so long as the electoral system is fair. Look at the American system. They kicked the bum out. Um, his name was Donald Trump. There was a huge um, um, political accident when Trump was elected and the country with an overwhelming uh, 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 popular vote um, and a reasonable electoral college vote said, hey, <laughs> we've got to have a correction system. You have no such system in China or the Russian Federation. And so if you've got a brilliant Chinese emperor, which they've had in the past in the ages of uh, Qianlong and Kangxi and the rest, then the empire prospers. The Chinese also have a tradition of what they describe as bad emperor syndrome as well, where officials are too fearful to provide the emperor with uh, fa fair and impartial advice on what's going on in the world for fear that they'll lose their heads. Um, the second automatic stabilizer 
in our systems is um, markets. Markets are great stabilizers because they arbitrate price and they bring to life the principles which Adam Smith expounded on a couple of hundred years ago. And so they have their own corrective mechanisms as well through prices and ultimately price through exchange rates. And so in other words, the automatic stabilizers both politically and economically within our systems, while imperfect, have a predisposition to self-correct. Authoritarian states rely upon not an invisible hand to do that, but the hand uh, of numero uno. And I don't know anyone bright enough to be numero uno who can uh, do that effectively without ultimately uh, creating um, a massive, massive reaction. Here's my last question before I ask you to, uh, to kind of sum up your thoughts on, on this day. Uh, and my question uh, was partly in, in some of the questions I saw from the audience, which is about information and about more specifically misinformation. And the question is about China. What does China rely on in terms of information on this story, on the Ukraine story right now? Do they, do they rely on Putin's version of events or do they rely on the events that the rest of us in the world are not just hearing, we're seeing, we're witnessing it on a daily, hourly, minute by minute basis? What do the Chinese believe? The Chinese Communist Party has a hundred year long history of dealing with Moscow. The party was founded in, 20, in 1921. It was run by the Comintern out of Moscow, really until um, Mao asserted uh, his own authority over the party and over the Comintern in the period 1935 to 42. Um, and if you read the long released uh, internal documents of the period, it's quite fascinating to see how distrustful uh, the Chinese Communist Party were of the Ruskies way back then um, in terms of actually telling them the absolute truth. They still had a comradely relationship and they still, as it were, managed a common program for revolutions in China and around the world. Uh, but did they actually trust uh, what the Russians said as a matter of, uh, of face value? No, not at all. So the idea that the uh, Chinese system would sit back and take everything that Vlad says as uh, gospel, I think stretches the truth. I think what I will say about the Chinese diplomatic apparatus is it's highly sophisticated and um, their analytical community uh, in Beijing is strong. They will have uh, at this, prior to the Ukraine crisis arising system, they would have at least 500 to 1000 Russia experts across multiple think tanks. Um, so their ability to, as it were, read everything in the Russian literature in Russian and to reach their own dis discernment as to what's actually going on, I think is real. I think the other source of information is their own intelligence gathering. They've got the, the Ministry of State Security, which is probably as formidable as the FSB uh, and, the, and the Russian external service uh, in terms of intelligence gathering, not as sophisticated as the CIA or MI6, but they're out there gathering stuff. And then there's good old CNN, which is um, uh, what's the media saying, even though we'll rail against what the media says on a daily basis. If you roll into the Ministry of Propaganda in Beijing, uh, I'm confident they'll have the usual uh, wall full of television screens with CNN, BBC and the rest uh, to see what the hell's being said uh, around the world about what's going on. Then it's synthesis. How do you pull this together? So it's multiple sources. Reminds me of the day I was in uh, Tariq Aziz's office in Baghdad just before the bombs fell in 2003. And his most reliable source of information was on the monitor he had in his office, which was on CNN, which of course was banned in Iraq at the time. Um, I know your time is precious uh, these days, especially on this day with the meeting that's been going on and others want to talk to you. So in the final minute or so, a closing thought from you, Kevin Rudd. Yeah, I think as we look at Ukraine, and earlier today I was speaking to a symposium um, by the um, uh, uh, Frederick uh, Ebert Foundation in Berlin um, on the same sort of question. Did we conclude more and more that uh, when we look at the future of global security, 
geography is real, but our security challenges are increasingly global. Um, Ukraine is not just a problem uh, of European security. Uh, it's a challenge for global security because its stake is the principle about the inviability of political sovereignty and territorial integrity. But it's not just the principle, it's the fact that the, as it were, the authoritarian world represented by Moscow and Beijing um, are um, uh, on one side of this argument and between them um, are actively challenging the United States, China in Asia, Russia in NATO and in Europe uh, to roll back the post 45 settlement. Um, so the seamlessness of the global security environment is now such whereby, for example, we in Australia have long had the view that when we talk about national security, it's largely an Asia Pacific or Indo Pacific phenomenon. And what you crazy Canadians do in NATO, that's a matter for you guys. It's a hangover from the Second World War. Good luck. Um, but we're concentrating on the main game here. Well, I'd say historically, Canada may have been wrong on that because it's also a Pacific power. But I think we've been wrong as well. Because European security and transatlantic security is of fundamental significance to global security, including what's unfolding in our part of the world. And the central dynamic of this is this new Russia-China relationship. Um, remember China's deep calculus is that for Beijing, Moscow is a force multiplier. It's not just because it uh, removes a strategic problem for Beijing and its ability to focus on the American adversary uh, in uh, the Indo-Pacific. Um, it's also because uh, Russia represents a, a distraction uh, for uh, US strategic power by constantly bogging down the United States, either in Europe or in the Middle East, as we've seen most recently in Syria before the current crisis in Ukraine. And so for those reasons, uh, the strategic collaboration between the two is pretty important for the future of global security. Hence the questions, Peter, you began our discussion with, which is how durable is this relationship and where will Xi Jinping come out in terms of being a mediator or someone who is actually secretly rooting for the Russians to win and win big. China's national interest, quite apart from the bromance between the two leaders, uh, is, uh, is frankly for Russia to prevail. Um, but I say again, if Putin were to fail either in the field and then fall politically, uh, the ricochet effect back into Chinese domestic politics would be formidable. And we would then be into an intense period of six months analysis leading up to the 20th Party Congress, which I think will turn out to be the decisive political event uh, for the next, the first half of this century. If Xi Jinping remains in power, then we have uh, fundamental fault lines for all of us for the future. If the party moves against Xi Jinping, which is not probable, but it's possible, then uh, alternative trajectories open up for the future. I'll leave my comments there. Well, that's a that's a you know a, a very interesting place to leave them, and gives us a lot a lot to think about. Um, it's been a fascinating conversation. I really appreciate your time. Kevin Rudds, the former Prime Minister of Australia, is currently the Global President of the Asia Society. He's been in New York. Uh, th we thank you. Both of us thank you for your questions and your attention in this last hour. Uh, this has been a presentation of the Monk School at the University of Toronto. I'm Peter Mansbridge. Thanks so much. <laughs>